Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to Scale House Voices featuring V. Maldonado. We're so excited to have you with us for our fourth Scale House Voices event of 2021. I'm Stephanie Parnes, Gallery Associate here at Scale House. And on behalf of Scale House, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight and for taking time to support art communities. Now in its fourth season, Scale House Voices is a series of talks with local and visiting artists and scholars, exploring ideas and techniques, practice and process, creativity and culture. As part of our continued learning and developmental and developing critical awareness, Scale House would like to acknowledge that we are currently on stolen land. Those of us in Central Oregon live and work on the traditional territory of the Confederation of Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute Native American tribes. It is essential that we recognize that the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute peoples signed treaties under great duress and threat. We are thus accountable for the past and current violence that indigenous people face. As an expression of gratitude and appreciation for those on whose territory we reside, we will be forwarding proceeds from tonight's talk to the Warm Springs Community Action Team and to Nanawit, a community of Warm Springs artists. Before I introduce our speaker, please note there will be a Q&A session following the presentation. And there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please submit your questions at any time and we will leave time at the end to discuss. And finally, I am delighted to introduce V. V Maldonado is an interdisciplinary artist, curator and writer currently based in Portland, Oregon. They were born in Michoacan, Mexico, and grew up in the central San Joaquin Valley of California in a family of migrant field laborers. They are currently director of the intercultural, of intercultural engagement, equity, and inclusion at Willamette University's Pacific Northwest College of Art. This year, they became both ombudsperson and department head of painting. They received their BFA in painting and drawing from the California College of Art their MFA in painting and drawing from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, and are currently exclusively represented by the Froelich Gallery in Portland, Oregon. Their work is included in the permanent collections of the Portland Art Museum, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon, the Tacoma Art Museum in Tacoma, Washington, the Museum of Fine Art in Houston, Texas, and the Halley Ford Museum of Art in Salem, Oregon. Maldonado, who identifies as queer Mexican American or Corepecha, will be speaking on their career as an artist and on the building of personhood through painting and drawing. Their work explores the elasticity of identity in a society that demands rigidity. As any individual's personality, or sorry, positionality and privilege in the world can author their character. Maldonado's creative practice is designed to break societal molds to live more honest lives as humans and as artists. The process of thinking with one's own hands and listening with the body are wonderful acts of reclamation. Through their creative practice, they seek dialogue, transformation, and renewal within contemporary society. And now, please welcome me, welcome, <laughs> join me, Please join me in welcoming V. Maldonado. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you, Scale House, <clears throat> for inviting me. Um, I'm really nervous and excited to share my work with you all today. Um, and right now, you all are just a list of names uh, in, in the sidebar here. Um, I hope that someday we will get to meet away from our keyboards. I know that some of the names are familiar to me, so I hope to see old students uh, near near and dear. I, I would say that uh, because we're I'm coming to you via Zoom, um, you know, my life may uh, at some point uh, seed one of these, these permeable membrane that is the frame of, of this uh, computer and my, my pets may, may say hello. Um, 
but, it, but it's okay. Uh, I, I think my, my dog Ollie is gonna join us here uh, and, and my cat uh, 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 Muffin Cobain over there. So apologies <laughs> for the distractions. It's just part of working from home that all of us artists have. But you know, I, I, I think when Scale House invited me to join them in this artist talk series, I was so excited because I, I think the little I knew of, of Scale House, I think I was impressed by uh, not just the 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 reach that I, I think they they're they're after, um, but the, the people that they had chosen to invite, I think I really respect uh, and and see as as beacons in the creative community. So I was really honored, Stephanie and and the rest of the staff, when when you all worked with me over the summer to kind of get here to y'all. So thank you all for making time. Um, today, what I really wanted to do was take you know a, a little bit of time to share with you some of my lived experience and how uh, you know leading a life of creative practice as an artist and designer has helped me um, not just navigate a lot of uh, unnecessary obstacles created by bigotry, uh, colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, um, because as an indigenous Mexican immigrating you know from the get-go from you know 40 days old, there was a, a lot of uh, systems trauma that, that I had to experience and survive to get here. So, you know, by now I, I do feel a, a bit of, 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 you know, of a survivor uh, of these systems. And, and I think as, an, as a professional artist and educator and administrator, I do everything in my power to make sure that other artists don't have to uh, exist and experience those traumatic systems that exploit our labor, our identities um, that that make us exploit each other in society, um, and I you know I often see uh, my creative practice and and the creative practice of the creative people around me as uh, creative outlets to something outside of capitalism, something outside of the immediate uh, artificial hell that we're experiencing. So again, I, I I'm I'm still 15 months into Zoom lecturing y'all, but I can see your your uh, your chat window. Uh, if you want to uh, throw things my way, please. While I'm I'm talking, uh, there'll be a Q and A session, but I, I don't want to be so closed off and hermetic. So because um, I, I will kind of share things that, that that I think I haven't shared in the past about my upbringing that I think, in reflection, and looking back, I now see that you know as an artist rooted in craft, uh, fine art traditions of studio practice. Uh, but later becoming very experimental, you know, my whole body is a testing ground. Uh, and, and I think I learned through the years how to make things um, with my hands, uh, how to understand the world with my mind. But I think recently I've really been interested in using painting and drawing as a way to just remake myself, to reprogram myself uh, in, in a radical way where I don't have to wait to be liberated by any body or anything. Um, so uh, again, thank you all for taking the time to let me share uh, my work with y'all. Um, so I start with this slide, which is kind of very bare and minimal, but I think one of the most uh, kind of dramatic or, or noteworthy things that my creative practice has yielded, you know, as, as, as a displaced person whose ancestors have been largely erased, marginalized, uh, and minoritized in the status quo of white supremacy and capitalism of the patriarchy, you know, in, in terms of this cultural pecking order uh, that's infused with anti-Black racism, right, that divorces us from not just these lands that we, we as settlers kind of uh, pretend to name in Eurocentric ways, right, but I think so much of what I've recognized as an artist is who I think I am is also a product of that colonialism, of that imperialism, which is really 500 years old, right? So I think so much of what my creative practice has taught me is how to make a self. Um, as a designer, I've learned how to make a lot of functional objects. And I think over the years, I've just started to take my own advice that I give my students you know, in design classes. And I really started taking the idea, not just of transformation through creative practice seriously, but about, really attempting to transgress things that I might not otherwise attempt to transgress, like personhood, 
self-identity, masculinity, manhood, uh, cis masculinity, uh, and the privilege that that does bring even somebody who's minoritized within a, a colorist, racist class and, and caste system, right? Is that, again, there's always a hierarchy to power. Um, and so in many ways, uh, me choosing to transition from a cis male to a non-binary person was as much uh, a recognition of myself outside of these um, really hurtful binaries that weren't serving me as a person, but also um, it was a way for me to be for something. And I, I think for me, my identity now as a creative person, as, as a non-binary person, as a genderqueer person um, in, a, in a happily you know, monogamous relationship with a cis woman, raising children, making art, teaching, right? I, I think I learned that beyond what white supremacy and the patriarchy had offered me, there's, there's actually a lot of feeling that I couldn't have gotten to earlier in my life. So again, I, I don't know where, what I'm becoming, but I'm so excited to have the ability to not just use my creative skills to make things that look like art, but to actually just be alive. Uh, so that anything I do, in, in a sense, could be a rupture for somebody to re be, you know, recognize it as art, for, or, or for me to pose it as art. So um, I want to start um, kind of, you know, uh, back, you know, when I was a, a graduate student at the School of the Arts of Chicago, really being exposed to, a, you know, a broad world, trying to make sense of, of, uh, of myself um, and, and the world around me. Um, but not really having a language, y'all. I, I think I'd gotten through my undergrad really just feeling like an imposter the whole time. Like I didn't belong in the art world. Like I didn't belong in art history. Yeah, I didn't see the stories of, of my ancestors or even of, of my family uh, in the, the, the galleries, in the museums, in the art history pages. Um, so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a wonder that I didn't feel like I belonged. So I think um, since, uh, you know, since I started out, I think I've been compelled to make things that look like art so that people would believe I was an artist um, and, and didn't really, you know, want to have them question whether or not it was art, um, you know. Uh, so again, at this point, I'm thinking about how do I, as, as this non-normative transient person in society, because that's how I thought myself, that person being so displaced as a, as a first an immigrant, uh, who you know was born in Mexico, but very quickly crossed the border when I was 40 days old. You know, I recently learned from uh, my mother that the reason she chose to uh, give birth in Mexico is that she didn't want to be alone in California. You know, my father was undocumented then, and uh, he he migrated back and forth with work and his family. And um, you know, she was up here in the United States. She was uh, documented, but my dad wasn't. And, I didn't know this until very recently, but it's really profound that she had this, this immense need for community. And, and so she returned to Changuitiro, Michoacan, where I'm from in Southern Mexico, um, you know, seeking the support of, of, of family. Um, and so I really returned to kind of thinking about what my family was about. And, and you know, I grew up as, as an immigrant, as a migrant, as a displaced indigenous person, as a non-normative person, never thinking of home as a geography located in one place, but really, you know, that car that we drove back and forth with from Chanquitiro back and forth, um, you know, that was home to me. So any, anywhere the people that I love that, that were loving me were, that was home. Um, and so I began to really uh, reach out into popular culture for, uh, you know, for that language. Uh, so intuitively, um, you know, I kind of borrowed from kind of the stereotypes around Latin American art at that time. So this is around 2003, 2004, um, quote unquote, identity art is not in fashion. Uh, formalism is, you know, the, the rise of zombie art is all around me in grad school. Um, and there's this profound wealth of both technology and a de-skilling in art in the early 2000s. And I think as, as an artist, I felt at a crossroads. Um, and, and so I felt really free to kind of set, set my own path. Um, Ultimately, though, I kept returning to both this dire nationalism that has shaped me as an immigrant that where I had to enculturate. So what we're looking at is actually not one of my pieces is an Andy Warhol, Mickey Mouse. Um, but I think it's really indicative of kind of the aesthetic and mindset that I was really kind of trying to rupture my way 
like away from um, not just this idea of becoming American, but radically questioning why that happened, what the outcomes of that were, what I lost in becoming American, um, and, and maybe what I've gained by rejecting a lot of the, the status quo. Um, and so almost, you know, again, uh, maybe borrowing from the pop artist, but I, but I think in a more deeply cynical way, where I think so much of of uh, the undercurrent and, and, and subtext of pop art is that queer culture that isn't present in mainstream culture. So again, we live in this popular culture that explicitly sells us images to replace our ancestors, our family, ourselves, and implicitly uh, uh, kind of sells us something that can never be fulfilled, right? We're, we're, we're never actually going to befriend Mickey. We're, we're never gonna meet Andy, right? No matter how much we love art and other artists of the past, we're not gonna meet them. So I think for me, so much of what I've been uh, caught up in is this idea of, of kind of humanizing my, 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 my practice. Um, and for me, that's, that's been, uh, infusing uh, my, my drawings and paintings with the stories of my upbringing, of, of my childhood, my birthplace. What you're looking at is actually two pictures that my sister, Christina, who's, I'm the oldest of four and Christina is the second in the family. And as one of her art projects, uh, I think in high school, she went back and documented um, the house on, on, the, on the picture on the left here is the house that I was born in that my father built to be able to marry my mom uh, that I later was, was uh, born in. Um, uh, and then here's a, 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 a kind of a close up of the, of the a little kind of washing uh, station that I almost died in. Um, and, and this kind of, I think for me, represents a kind of beginning uh, language. Uh, a, a lot of the architecture, a lot of the mix of a kind of farm life and, 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 and rural living with the more kind of like uh, Americanization of, of my village as, as things like indoor plumbing, you know, electricity, the phone, water became more, more regular, right? We didn't, you know, the women of the village didn't have to spend half the day going to get water for us, right? Um, as, as I think um, I, I enculturated and became well, quote unquote modern, um, my work reflected that. And, and I think this is a piece uh, called Flood Escalade that I did uh, shortly after returning uh, to Portland from graduate school. So this is around 2007. Um, again, this is uh, work largely that I've exhibited at Froelich Gallery in, in Portland. Um, some of the work like the one you just saw was produced in Chicago. Um, but again, I, I think most of the work that you're seeing really, I think I've, I've, I've lived and worked from Portland, Oregon. Again, Flood Escalade was, was created um, kind of uh, in an era after 9-11 where, where I think any kind of critique of nationalism, enculturation, erasure, uh, colonialism, I think really took a backseat because there was urgent need of, for patriotism to take over. And, and I think for me at this time, I was really trying to reflect on kind of like the, the, the artificiality of patriotism. Uh, and, and, and I think flood escalated for me too was kind of like, in kind of this urgent artificial uh, 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 emergency that that you know was created around 9/11, there was this other urgent matter called the you know an environmental degradation that we weren't paying attention to. I think for me as as a person as an artist, I was trying to negotiate these two very different planes of kind of lived experience versus how we were being kind of shaped as a society as 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 a body populace and. You know, there was everybody was ready to be a patriot. Uh, it was amazing in, in, in that time afterwards. And, and again, I think as nationalism wanes and wanders, I, I think our identities get tied to that. You know, I think in Mexico, you know, there is also this deep nationalism as an as an Mexican American person. There's this kind of internalized conflict about what the American dream means um, individually, collectively. You know, so much of white Anglo. Uh, American culture prizes isolation and individuality, but so much of my upbringing taught me to value uh, not just my body and its limits, but the collective, the village, 
the family, the the great grandparents, you know, the the collective experience. So I, I think I, I think I'm thinking about kind of this call culture that I was being called to as then a, a Mexican cis man, right, in society. Like, how do I show that I have status and power in a society founded on these fictions of colonialism and imperialism? And so I found myself kind of grappling for both abstract and symbolic ways of showing you all that. So again, this is a mixture of a, you know, a painting the size of, a, of a, a, an Escalade, um, but then where the rims, instead of being very masculine, you know, metal rims, they're actually just giant lace doilies. Because at this point, I'm really thinking about how much of my upbringing really created a boundary between my, my kind of my role as a maker. And I was really interested in, in the work of women and, and the beautiful lace work of, of the women uh, around me that I grew up with, the storytelling embedded in that. And I, I, I see now that I'm, I'm trying to engage with that because I think so much of what I learned about whoever I am and whatever I am came from these stories and these voices. Um, and I, I, I was after wanting to conjure that. You know, the, the other voices besides the powerful Mexican indigenous women in my family that shaped me, were the voices of the televisions, of uh, the shows that really, I think, represent a lot of my upbringing as, as a first generation immigrant growing up in California, wanting to, at, at that point, really uh, not be questioned as an American because I was a, a documented immigrant. There was so much uh, uh, explicit discrimination and racism for people who had any kind of accent. I had a, a, a an inability to kind of talk without a lisp for so long that uh, you know I got put through speech therapy classes and I, I got taught how to kind of speak like I'm from California. Um, so it's it's no wonder that I sound like a white boy because I got trained how to talk like a white boy so that I would pass and 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 get the privilege of, of that culture. And I think I really began not only to explicitly reject that, but look at that uh, kind of male dominant culture and coding. And, and understand the media outlets that were that were doing that. So what you're looking at is actually a series of paintings, and I'll let you count them. But I'll tell you the important part is that each of those paintings is installed um, relative to its size in my memory of where it existed in our house growing up. So the bottom paintings are, you know, console televisions from where. You know, we had big living rooms and my dad and I could sit on our bellies and watching everything from Kung Fu theater to Fantasy Island, right? Or a telenovela. Um, you know, the ones you see in the middle are, are, are maybe uh, TVs you, you might find in bedrooms, right? Uh, uh, because I think when, when people started having, you know, TVs in their own bedroom, that means that we were moving forward, right? And then actually the ones you see on top are scattered because oftentimes those are TVs that one might find in public spaces. Um, you know, growing up in, in Changuitiro, we shared a phone, we shared a water well, and, and, and we shared these little corner bodegas where you'd go get food and snacks and stuff, but you'd also go watch, you know, if you didn't have a team in your house, you'd, you'd go there. So again, I think I, I wanted to look at not just linear time with painting in, in this practice, but I wanted to start folding time with my practice in a way that I hadn't been taught in, in, in a, a traditional way. So this is really, I think, when I started moving away from paintings as depictions to paintings that, you know, for, for all the reasons carry st status of their own. You know, after the end of art, anything that looks at, at, like art is quotidian, right? So I think I'm also really confronting how immense the legacy of art is at this point. And, and, and really thinking about how do I rid, you know, my, my, my creative practice of, of all of the insidious you know past and and I, and I know I couldn't it's it's always there you you you're always connected to it and I think in, in, in many ways it creates the body of memory that in the end changes our behavior um, and, and I really started thinking about you know how, how can I make paintings that you know people don't have to spend any time thinking about what they're looking at but immediately know that it's not a painting that they look at, but actually it's paintings that look back at them. Um, because I think the things that I was confronting were way bigger than you know a Sunday painting session. Um, the painting you're looking at now is titled Gate. And really, I think for me, it was a way to confront kind of this, this, this explicit 
racist gatekeeping culture that uh, America is founded on. Uh, and, and it's ugly, you know, it's continuous. And uh, under the last administration, we saw no end to the way that the wall was deployed as a prop for nationalism. It's disgusting. Um, and for me, you know, this piece is some a piece I think I can keep making for the next hundred years. I don't see how North American politics don't always need the straw man of Latin American politics to create these crises at the border with drugs or you name it. Uh, you know, Latin and ex people, Latin American people have been a scapegoat for so much. And, you know, that we, we've built a whole nation on this continuing labor. And I, I just, for me, I, I wanted to create a monument to the catastrophe of white capitalism. And, and, and I thought, how can I make a gate into that white capitalist artificial hell we call America? So, um, you know, having studied abroad and visited the Dorsa, I, 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 I thought, you know, I'm going to make my own version of the Gates of Hell. So, based on the uh, dimensions of the Gates of Hell by Rodin, I created this four-panel painting that, as you get close, it dissolves into individual panels that are chain-link fence. That again, I think you, you don't need to think a lot about what a chain-link fence is or what it means it means that you don't get to cross. Um, so again, I think I, I was interested in creating ruptures in that culture and showing how, you know, how porous the most fascist uh, uh, border is. And no matter how much you try to keep uh, the people out, you can't because they move like nature. We move like nature because we are nature and the institutions are not nature and that's why they can't move. And that's why they have to make things like static walls, because that's what institutions are. They're static walls and they can't move. And I wanted a monument to that. And, and, I, and I wanted to really not just the beauty of that knowledge, but I, I wanted you to get a sense of how the anger is fueling me and not defeating me. Because I think so much of, of what I was feeling then as a non-white artist uh, who identified as non-white. I, I didn't identify as, as nonsense yet, but I knew I was an outsider. I knew that because I was not white, I didn't belong in that highest of patriarchy. You know, it's always exclusionary, right? And, and the art world is, and the design world is, and that's how value is rendered. So again, I, I think I, I wanted to also point to the fallacy. Also, this painting and the painting before it made a lot of use of glitter paint, y'all, which is so tacky, right? And so easy to get wrong. And also, uh, chroma key green paint that is so indicative of special effects culture, right? That what you see is not what you get, that you don't know what you're gonna see. You could see anything, right? So um, again, there's this kind of um, fungibility at this point of, of what it all means, right? We, we live in this catastrophic kind of national nightmare where we can gel children at the border so our children can feel safe going to school without masks, right? It's absurd. Um, and, and I think I, I didn't know quite how to capture the immensity of that absurdity. So Froelich Gallery, my dear friend and longtime dealer, Charles, was kind enough to let me take over, you know, not just the walls of his gallery to hang art, but actually to create a giant, you know, fenced in space where um, all of us could feel the feeling. Uh, of being inside together in, in that way or outside, depending on how you were thinking of the gate. And so I was able to take my, my print making to a monumental scale by using kind of a, a, a actually a roll lin linoleum block technique where I, I created a kind of specialty roller. But again, I think this is where I, I knew that I was moving in the right, right direction. As soon as I, I got to these really big uh, concepts of space and time within settler colonialist myths of white supremacy and, and, and white beauty, by the way, um, I was able to very quickly kind of go at it. So um, what you see is, is a large panel painting where, again, I'm using that chroma key green, but uh, as you approach, really, the, the, the painting becomes more physical and heavy. Um, I'm also taking things like color crayons and making uh, encaustic paintings that have very ancient kind of encaustic paintings, so mixing old and new. Um, and, I, and I'm trying to, you know, actually get as witchy as I can with my techniques and, and really, I think, create an experience, uh, olfact, like an olfactory experience as much as a visual experience. I, I wanted 
I didn't know what I wanted my viewers to think about my art, but I wanted them to feel it with their whole bodies. I wanted them to think about what I was doing with their whole bodies. And I think when I started asking my audience, and you know, again, that's that's a that's a big kind of ask, this 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 anonymous audience to start feeling with their whole body, I realized I had to start making with my whole body. Um, and that really, I think, negotiated and necessitated a lot of different behavior for me that was exciting. So what you're looking at is like a 12 by 12 inch kind of like uh, unique panel painting that, you know, is created through destruction. So I'm really thinking a lot of the skill sets that I that I learned as an undergrad, you know, in a very craft driven environment at CCAC, as it was known then, now it's the California College of Arts, but really thinking about this kind of material consciousness and how you know, in many ways, the, the, the color crayon, the wax were these metaphors for my experience as you name it, right? As somebody not born in this country, as, as an indigenous person who was colonized and, you know, nationalized into kind of a Mexican identity that plays into kind of North American politics for cheap and free labor, right? And, and, and the forced migration and, and the kind of lifelong debt and trauma that, that you carry with you. And, you know, as an artist, I found that only by making with my whole body, could you all as my audience tap into my, my the, the, the generational trauma that was driving my choices, but also y'all, the generational joy that's driving my choices because it's only been 500 years since these settler myths have been kind of covering our eyes and shrouding our bodies. And so my feeling is let's just tell our stories, right? Let's not just, turn away from these settler myths and, you know, toxic, rancid nationalism. Let's replace it with something joyful, elegant, beautiful. And so I think for me, this rejection of, of, of evil power is actually uh, not just about that, but, but, but this joyful reminder of what actually is so beautiful and exciting about what we do as artists and makers. So again, I think uh, for me, it was about being as joyful and big as possible. So what you're looking at are framed pages from a catalog of uh, the Sistine Chapel, uh, Sistine Chapel by uh, Michelangelo, where I was really just going through this process of aesthetic erasure. So I didn't know what I was at this point, but I wanted to go, but I knew I had to go through the process of kind of erasing everything I wasn't. So really rejecting this aesthetic Catholicism that had colonized the souls and spirits of, of my ancestors that, would, that mixed the indigenous and the colonized and the nationalist, right? So I, I, I didn't know how to see it. So I started just covering all, all up and negating it as a strategy. So erasure, yielding erasure. So if, if my ancestors are, are erased, I must erase ancestors was my thinking then. Uh, and, you know, Michelangelo was an aesthetic ancestor who I think for a lot of artists who were trained in the way I was trained really represented kind of an aesthetic kind of high watermark, right? In terms of grandeur, power, beauty. You know, again, this is an artist whose, whose job was to decorate the halls and ceilings of regions and kings, you know, because they had connections to God, right? And again, my connections weren't like that. I, that was not my world. Uh, so this is the interior of the Sistine Chapel uh, at the Vatican. And, and so for me, I think it was kind of in, in the same way that I, I kind of played with uh, formalism and, 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 and minimalism by making, you know, making it out of color crayons. I was really thinking about kind of what you see is what you get. And, and you know, what, what do you get when you strip away the fancy veneer of these beautiful images that sell us Western gods and deities, Western orders of our bodies, of our, of our genders, of our races and ethnicities, of even what year it is. What if we all don't start with the artificial birth date of a creator? Uh, what, if, what if we choose a different way to start? And so I, I think for me, uh, you know, what really started as an aesthetic exploration and painting and drawing very quickly became a project of embodiment of not just making images of some imagined ancestor that I'm, I, I will, I, you know, that, that, I, that I will exploit by conjuring them 
or, or by making images of people in my community, right? Enjoy or not joy, right? Um, so I really started thinking about kind of this power of authorship that I, as, a, um, as, an, as an artist had for um, making images and, and, and how so much of what I was holding onto uh, was that power. Um, and, and, uh, um, um, and, and how it was so hard for me ultimately I think to let go of, of, of that. So I, I think what you're looking at is actually uh, one of my pieces, but not a, an image that, that, that I made. Um, it, it's actually uh, an image taken by my spouse, Anna Joyce, at the Gorge uh, from Skemania Lodge, really thinking about you know, self-identity, self-authorhood, and, and what does it mean when you know, we as artists aren't the ones responsible for our identity? Uh, so this series started now uh, in, uh, I would say, 2013, 2012, uh, in different manifestations. This is one of the earliest manifestations with the silver masks. Uh, and this piece is called Gorge, but really thinking about this imagine and pretend, pretend wild, right? So, you know, you can look a lot of this picture, it's pretty big. Um, and it might take you a while to realize, well, all you're looking at is, is a golf course in front of the gorge, right? That looks very natural and, and untouched, but actually it's so touched. It's so touched and it's being touched every day. Uh, every day that we pretend it's what it is, it, it, it's being erased, it's being covered, uh, it's being marginalized and mitigated. So. Again, I think I, I wanted to look at my complicity in these exact systems that I was unpacking as an anti-racist and anti-capitalist and seeing myself as uh, the center of the character. Um, so um, I apologize for any extra noises. Uh, my, my, my spouse is cooking dinner. And uh, so I apologize for, for any extra noises. It's just part of kind of lecturing from, from my house. Um, the, the other thing is uh, I had this really profound feeling of not being um, hooked to anything anymore. You know, I, I really got to an end with a lot of these uh, Western historical canons, these modern masters that were supposedly, you know, abstracting their way out of the power structures of the oligarchs behind the scenes, right? And ultimately, I think I was so cynical, you know, by the uns, um, that, that I, I, I felt a wash. And, and, and I think I, I really wanted to start capturing that in public settings. So I think the, the other thing that I would mention is that this series also begins to function largely outside of the gallery and studio uh, and, and really just acts in the world. Um, each of these pieces does exist as a standalone inject print, but largely they're designed for social media. Um, and they're always taken by somebody else because I'm always the person in the mask. Um, and, and each picture is its own kind of situational comedy. But again, thinking about how do I get you to feel with your whole body, just how lost as an artist I was feeling in the Northwest. Um, you know, being, being really drowned by this artificial culture of constant relevancy. Uh, it, and, and constantly being gatekept by white curators. It, it was exhaust. It, it is exhausting, y'all, having to apply to grants, having to, to, to you know, write essays about why I deserve to be included and, and, and be relevant. And, and I think I knew even then that I, I, I didn't want that and, and that I wanted my work, I, I think, to not just liberate me from these uh, fascist systems of power, but to offer me just uh, kind of forks in the road where I could possibly imagine new ways to think and encounter these systems that might shift the power. So I didn't have to feel this way. So we didn't have to feel this way as people. Um, I think largely too, um, with the uh, Mad Mech series, which is all the, all the pieces that you're seeing where I'm in costume are Mad Mechs. Um, uh, and again, that, that, that borrows from, you know, popular culture um, and, and borrows from the fact that, you know, in, in, in the Pacific Northwest, nobody really knows much about Lucha. They just know that you're a weirdo in a mask. And if you ask them to take a picture of you just doing something funny or strange, everybody's going to say yes, right? I, I think one of the things that I, that I realized as an artist living in Portland, the Northwest, is it's just 
level of everyday absurdity that people just put up with. So like me making, you know, socially, uh, uh, you know, questionable public art, uh, quote unquote, wasn't that big of a deal. Um, I mean, sometimes people got annoyed, but they walked away and it was okay. And, and I, I think, you know, I, I, I was trying to express not just this feeling of outsiderness and being lost here, you know, being so far away from Changuitiro as my, 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 uh, my godmother, grandmother, uh, and she said, you know, why do you live up there? You're so far, right? And, and just feeling so lost, but, but knowing that, you know, the Northwest was becoming home um, and, and, and that I was digging in um, and, and that maybe I, I wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, this one is, is titled Duck Fur. And, and, and really, I, I started thinking about, you know, how, how much of, of me and my life can I let you into? And, and, and I, again, I think I was, I was really struggling with this mask work to identify not just uh, the kefabe in the, the practice of, you know, everybody knows in, in a lucha fight that it's fake, but they want to see a real fight. They want to see a real struggle. They want to see real blood. They want to see real sweat, right? They want to really see somebody cry because they lost. And, you know, I, I, I just, I, I kept thinking, you know, how, how do I not just invite that whole body engagement and listening, you know, but, but, but how do I let myself become more radically vulnerable within these structures that honestly all were designed to make me feel good and safe. Um, and, and so I, I started looking at kind of my gender identity as a, a cis male uh, and, 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 and again, the binaries and, 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 and how fixed a lot of kind of who I was already was in those roles. And, and, and I think, Ultimately, what I, what I didn't realize I was going to learn through this Mad Mech series is, is honestly how, how to be a man and then stop being a man um, and, and really become this whole person who's more complicated than the gender binary that Western society offered me when I was born that identified me. And um, so I, I started, you know, inculcating people around me more and more into my work. So oftentimes my children uh, out in public uh, up here in my work. So, you know, the, the people that the, the masked person is, is with, you know, I think ultimately there was a body language that I was expressing, but I think they're, they're also expressing. And I think, uh, you know, ultimately, I think my work is not in a vacuum. It's, it's in the context of family, of society. I, I would say what I've learned uh, through the mask work is um, that, you know, uh, Society is a place designed to have us pass through, um, but um, family is a place we can always be a part of. And, uh, you know, this Mass Cam series, I think, gave me a way to take a look at kind of the stereotypes that kind of was, were thrown my way that I had to kind of like confront um, in this very kind of binary way. And, and I think I wanted something more fluid, less constrained. Um, so I moved away from the mask work and, 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 I, and, and I stopped largely doing this mask hand series, though I would say never say never in art because both have returned. Um, but again, I, I think I, I, you know, part of my, my transitioning, I think also conjured this transitioning back to myself and, and back to painting which ultimately is I think what uh, The Fallen is about. Um, that, um, yeah, I, I think after all is said and done, after the fight uh, is lost or won, you know, and the audience is happy or sad, right? After this, this theater, the Shakespearean theater of Western art and society, right? The, the catastrophe of disaster capitalism, of pandemic capitalism, uh, that just yields more exploitation of, of the already exploited, the already marginalized, the already erased, uh, the already missing and disappeared. Uh, it just got worse. It didn't get better. And I, 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 don't, uh, I, I don't find joy in making work that I think lets people uh, kind of turn away from the reality of life. But also I, I know that oftentimes people, you know, come to creative spaces um, for different reasons. And, and so I think uh, I finally, I think, let go of that need for authorship 
And, and that need, I think, to take up all the space with my imagination and my work. And I think for me, the, the, the work that I'm doing now in painting and drawing is, is a kind of, of lucha, you know, it's a kind of wrestling, but it's, it's a grappling, right? I, I, whatever I am, I realize that it's this, this, this intersection between uh, uh, my internal and external worlds that you're a part of. And so the paintings that I'm making now, like The Fallen, really return to, you know, what I was doing early on as, as a young artist was, you know, doing automatic work uh, that I think let me do abstract expressionist uh, uh, image making that ultimately I think I would eradicate or, or compromise. Uh, making use, I think a lot of that aesthetic that, that I, I had as a, as a you know, young artist infused by, by, by pop art um, and, and folks like Warhol. Um, but again, I think I, I was at this point still trying to express the, you know, how much it's, I think it's difficult for people in our society to save each other because they can't even save themselves. Uh, everybody's fighting with each other because it's easier to fight with each other than it is to fight with yourself and find resolution with yourself, right? And so I think for me, ultimately, I've returned to painting because it is this way for me to actively listen with my whole body and think with my hands. But, but also I think think things that I might not be able to think within capitalism or the patriarchy uh, that, 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 that might fuel anti-Black racism or ableism that I know will because I'm part of those systems, right? And this lets me see how I'm not free of those forces. Uh, and no painting that I make and no painting that you see will free us from the forces of settler colonialism and imperialism. I, I hate to tell it to you, but it isn't. It's something bigger than that. But I think ultimately I found that by making my own work, I can be my own person. And that's how you can look at my work. And if you can be yourself, you can also make your own work and look at my work. Um, and so I, I, I work to imagine you know, these grand spaces not filled with commercial exchanges, uh, but with this kind of joyful labor of meeting our needs. And I, again, I think they, they take these giant abstract fantastical turns, but I mean, largely it's me still abstracting visual imagery from the mask. Um, uh, there, there, you know, there's a lot of work that you, I didn't show you that led to this painting for a long time. I was you know, just painting giant lucha masks uh, that then I let go of. But I, I think for me, given the time that we had, I, I wanted to focus more on, on, on not just my creative practice as a means to understand this generational trauma uh, and experience of displacement through colonialism, uh, imperialism, nationalism, and, and the kind of racist systemic uh, 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 kind of like structure that everybody in my family uh, is caught up in. That I, as somebody with an MFA, am privileged enough not to have to be in. And so I find myself both critical of those systems, wanting to point them out, let you see them. But I find that ultimately, I, I think all I can do is see the world with my own eyes, experience it with my own body. And, and in the end, I think, hope that you all will do the same. Um, and that ultimately, I think we move forward in making something greater than a work of art, which is tending to the craft of community, uh, being with each other. Uh, so the paintings that I make and that I'm working on now, the drawings really, I think for me, are an opportunity to invite people to gather. Uh, to maybe look at in you know alone and ponder, but to maybe engage with in, in communion with other people. Uh, so so you know the, these paintings, these last two paintings that I've showed you are, are pretty large. They're they're about um, twelve feet long by about uh, uh, seven or nine feet tall sometimes. So you know they they too take up all my studio when I make them. But I, I find that if I make paintings that are the size of my studio. Uh, getting your body into the looking and feeling is a lot easier. Um, I want to thank Scale House for giving me an opportunity to really, I think, 
try to, in a very short amount of time, encapsulate something that I'm still struggling to understand, which is my ongoing creative practice myself. Um, but I feel gratitude for the opportunity, I think, to reflect and put into words that I didn't have when I started, uh, kind of what I've been doing. Uh, I thank my spouse and my children and my pets for their patience as I lecture from our dining room table. Um, and uh, if it's okay with everybody, I'd love to now just stop sharing my screen and engage with actual humans. Um, thank you all. Um, thank you so much, V. That was just incredible to listen to. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll leave some time for questions, but I'm just astounded at the, your, your ability to articulate, as you said, just the, the, the layers that your work exists in and is a part of and um, the networks that it, it connects to. Um, and I, I, it's incredibly inviting, not in the sense of it's comforting or, but it's, it's reaching out um, to, <laughs> to the viewer, to, to other bodies. Um, and I just, um, I so appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, friend. So, um, let's uh, see if we have some, some questions for V. Um, so Karen asked if, if possible um, to say a little about how your time at SAIC influenced your approach to art making? Oh, it was, it radicalized me. I, I, I think, I think, you know, I think a choosing to jump in with both feet to art school as a first gen student studying abroad. And I, and I think choosing to, you know, uproot our family that are, are you know, it was just my spouse and I, and, and, and uh, you know, go there. I, I think for me, it really, I was exposed to really amazing people like Dr. Uh, Kim Pinder, uh, who wrote this amazing book called Racing Art History. And it was so nice to sit in a classroom and have a professor be so honest about American history and its negative impact on society. And oh, it was it was like, ah, oh, I could learn, right? And, and I and I, think I never wanted to come back. And you know, Dr. Pinder now, you know, I think is is like at Yale and is like the head of you know their art school. And I, and I think that gives me such joy, right? So. I, I think for me, you know, SAIC let me know that the stories that I needed to tell through my practice were relevant and needed to happen, even though they weren't in fashion then. You know, so much of what, what uh, I, I loved about going to SAIC, I, I didn't need my work to be liked to make it, right? And I think it divorced me from, I think the, the trappings of a, being a popular culture it feels really good to be popular, especially now on Instagram, man, if everybody wants the likes and the more followers you have. But I think my education at SAIC, especially because it's really rooted, the liberal arts were really rooted. Uh, Chris Couture was there when I was, uh, David Raskin was there and still there. But I mean, really rooted in like anti-fascist, critical Marxist theory, where really it was about, are you doing your own work? Do you have your hands on the part of your work that you can accomplish? Are you connected to, you know, an invisible college of like, you know, stimulated intellectuals and artists, or do you have a studio, uh, do, you have, do you have a critical apparatus? Uh, as Larry Ridner kind of taught us at, when I was at, 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 at you know, at uh, CCAC um, to move forward because it's big and it's all bigger than us. And I, and I think the Frankfurt School, I think really had a huge impact on me as well in terms of what they were doing on a cultural level. So I, it being exposed to, to, you know, those folks in that way with those scholars. And by the way, having an amazing kind of mentorship program where the studio practice. So I, you know, and also I think folks like Michelle Grabner uh, were letting us know that we could have families and be curators and teachers and have families. And you didn't hear that a lot in the art world. So I think, uh, Chicago taught me, even though Chicago is not an easy place to live in, it taught me how to be a human artist in a way that I think if I had gone to 
uh, LA or New York, maybe it would have been too hard to be human. And I think part of what I love, love then and still love the love about being an artist living in Portland is that you do, you know, you do prioritize that that human experience. Does that make sense to the person that asked the question? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> she says thank you. Yes. Yeah. No, huge impact. <laughs> and, and also, you know, being able to go into the museum and engage. Uh, you know, I, I very cynically, I used to talk about the museum being like this warehouse full of booty, right, of, of kind of this cultural artifacts of imperialism, which they are, right, but I think that I think it also let me be like, wow, and look at how it's also all this other stuff, like, yes, it is that, but then I, I, I think it, for how everybody settles for Google searches and images, I, I'm really happy that I had the high touch impactful experience of en engaging directly as an art scholar, as an aesthetic scholar with works. So actually looking at Andy Warhol, you know, <laughs> you know and seeing how, how it was made. I, it's, it's funny because I think being rooted in craft, looking at art directly kind of lets you see how it was made. I love it. It's like, you know, the secrets, it's great. Absolutely, yeah. my goodness. Um, well, that actually sort of, links a bit to um, this next question when you're talking about you know your experience in Chicago teaching you how to be a human artist right um, um, could you talk a little bit about how your um, your artwork influences your work in education and vice versa how those roles I, they're they're, I, they're they're a continuum so I, yeah. I think for me when I really got to my pedagogy, it was about that immediate learning that Bell Hooks talks about. Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I work with a student, it's like, are you with yourself? Are you, are you with your work? And are you with your community? Mm -hmm. And everything I'm doing is about helping you know yourself as an artist. I'm not asking you if you're an artist. You're with me. So I know you're an artist, right? And, and, and I think for me, again, I think, and, and I think, also, because the more authentic they can be in their art, uh, the more authentic I can be in mine. Because again, we can move away from the stereotypes of the 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 things that confirm the world that that subjugates us, right? So I think as as you identify yourself, um, kind of this mutuality emerges. Because I think what I recognized, uh, you know, about you know, in my late thirties is that it doesn't matter how aesthetically liberated I get if the people around me are constantly being subjugated by aesthetics. Uh, and, and no thing, and there was, there, you know, I, I kept telling my design students, there's nothing that we can make that can ever compete with celebrities, politicians, or, ser or terrorists. Never, ever, ever can I make a thing that can counter the power of a Biden or a Trump or a Clinton or a Napoleon or a Pharaoh. Like, like there's just, there's a false equivalency culture in capitalism that makes people think absurdities. Uh, and, and so I think for me, um, you know, the, 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 what I do is, is connect people to themselves. And it becomes a very powerful act because I think when people start where they are, the learning is immediate and often shocking. So, Teaching has taught me how to be a human in a way that art could never, making art could, you come to an end, right? And, and, and I think, uh, and, and, and those ends can feel good, but they end. And I think for me, especially as, as, as an indigenous person working through understanding my own colonization, I'm working past the absurdity of Western time and thinking we live in 2021, whatever that means, right? And I'm trying to think uh, like Terry Totenmeyer, rest in peace in geologic time, like a lava flow, like a volcano. That's, that's what I wanna think like. And that's where I wanna paint from, right? Is that I'm not colonized, I'm in colonization, right? And, and, and so I, I think I, 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 I know what it feels like. So again, I, I recently heard a, a, or read a quote of Jasper John saying that so much of his work was about kind of getting rid of all the influence of the other artists. So for me, you know, working with other uh, artists who, who are emerging, it's really about helping them see what I see, 
which is so difficult to see because they've been coded to not see it, right? So much, so I mean, all the artists that I work with are very powerful, intelligent people who are going through this transformative process where they're, you know, uh, self-emerging and self-authoring. And the more that, especially because I get to work with graduate students, the more I can let them self-author and also author the world around me, by the way, which is not easy. Um, it's really exciting, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, I, I, I don't teach anymore. I think I have an opportunity, I think, to reflect on 15 years of teaching in like a really like, like capitalist centric white dominant era. I, I just, you know, I, I, I realize now that, you know, getting into CCAC and, and having enough scholarships to go and, you know, get finishing my degree and getting it, getting my MFA and teaching, I, I always thought it was going to be the beginning of a bigger pattern, but I see how easily our collective liberation is compromised by things like viruses uh, and our inability to create community out of crisis. Uh, so now really, I think the work that I'm making is, is in that uncomfortable space of, oh no, it's not going to get better, but we still have to get going and we still have to make space for our humanity despite that. Does that make sense? That was a really long-winded answer. Sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I loved it. It's, it's making me think a little bit about your, the thread of erasure in your work and how your erasure isn't one of blankness, right? Of like getting rid of clearing out, but it's filling back up with something else. And so there's this sort of both and of like, like you're, you're talking about, like we're never gonna get out of it and. Well, I mean, I think being exposed to amazing thinkers like Dr. Kimberly Pinder and scholars like Bell Hooks, right? I think really opened up to the power of radical feminism and women mm -hmm. in, in society and just the immensity of worlds that they carry, yeah. you know? And, 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 I, and I think largely, I, I think that's why I'm, I'm not interested in, in, in the project of masculinity as such. Uh, and I really, really, I mean, Honestly, I, Stephanie, I started taking the advice I give my students. I started living my own values and all the choices I make, not just that, you know, I didn't leave in the studio. So I, I think for me, I had to negotiate, you know, transitioning with a family, mm -hmm. uh, with children who love their Mexican dad, with a spouse who totally loved their, you know, you know, they're very complicated spouse. And, and, and I think for me, there, there, was, there, was, there was years where the work helped me think and feel through like, what do I want to erase? And do I really need to erase it? And I think, you know, shifting pronouns and even identifying as queer, you know, can be really painful for a lot of people in my community who are really homophobic and heteronormative. It just doesn't make sense to them. It's just like, they don't want to think about pronouns. You know, they want to don't, they don't want to think, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think for so long, I was dispossessed to that beingness that I was losing those people. Uh, and, and, and not in the right way, right? I, I, I think it's because I, I, I think, I, you know, I, I think my work is not for everybody. It's going to confuse a lot of people. Um, and I don't think you're bad for being confused. And I don't make the work to create a caste system of ins and outs. So I, I think the yes and that you're talking about, I think that's why the, the queer culture, the, why I identify as queer in, in a queer culture, a non-normative gender queer way is because I don't tie myself up in terms of my, my genitals in the way that so many people are. I, I don't have to step into my studio and think about what do people with my genitals do in the studio or what have, you know, it's, it, it's absurd. And I think a lot of the anti-racist uh, 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 de you know, decolonialist like education that I got at SAIC and that I sussed out for myself at, at CCA through through their amazing scholars. Because um, I, I, you know, I, I think when 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 you listen with your whole body, you realize you're carrying all these memories you you didn't listen to then. Uh, and and Stephanie, for me, I think what 15 years of teaching gave me was a mechanism to retrieve all the things I learned that I didn't want to learn, but that were relevant in the future for my students. And so I really love the idea of now 
of my body, if it's gonna be a thing to be like a vessel that carries flowers, right? So porous, holds water, but not for that long, right? We'll crack, uh, make another, right? And, and so I, I think so much of my creative practice um, you know, is, is turning to myself because I'm not teaching because I work for an institution now that doesn't need or want me to teach. Um, and so I, I think for me, it's a way to focus also my administrative duties in terms of what, what am I doing more effectively? So again, I think, you know, I have a show that I'm gonna be presenting at Frola Gallery um, in June next year, um, but life is complicated, right? And, and I think um, at this point, I feel fortunate to have, you know, 15 years worth of amazing artists that I've been able to learn and grow with. Because I, 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 I think part of why some of my students has hated me is that I'm the, act, the most active learner in the classroom. And sometimes that's what normative thinkers don't want. And so I, I find myself really moving away from normative top down white dominant patriarchal structures and systems and cultures um i I've, I've tried to make people feel like they belong in those systems for 10 years and i gotta say i've never felt like i belong so i understand what people don't you know tell me they don't belong but so i'm now so so i make paintings because you know despite what uh critics and historians taught me you know there is space for me in the history of art and painting and drawing. Mm -hmm. I get to tell uh, the joyful stories and the transformation stories that are the seed for other stories that I don't even have to think about. And that I don't have to anchor down in trauma and pain, but that I also don't have to erase that anger or pain. It can be there. And we can also find joy, by the way, that's medicine is that we don't have to be either or. And so I find myself really inspired by, you know, new students that, that I've met who come from the medical world, right? Who actually have been thinking about physiology, you know, our, our bodies in, in a really physical way. Um, and I've become such a philosopher. I, I love thinking about my body as much as, as, as pigment as just the body. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really I think returning to basics where, instead of like Leonardo da Vinci thinking of an Italian man as the center of the Vitruvian man, right? Well, what if we center on queer black disabled women who don't have access to primary care at the education system, who've been overserved by uh, the prison industrial complex because it's taken their family, right? Like what if our society starts there? What if, what if, what if our transportation starts with people who don't have any money or time to get anywhere, right? Turns out we can all Zoom to work, right? And I think so much of what I'm reflecting on is this deep anger of like, y'all didn't have to make it so hard for so long for so many people. So Jeff Bezos could go to outer space, right? All the bookstores that bright enlightenment in the way of knowledge by surprise in the bookstore disappeared for so many generations because one white man had to go to space, you know? And, 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 and again, I think I'm, I'm, I'm rejecting that culture in every way I can. Um, and I hope to find a teaching space where I can engage with active learners who are actively listening with their whole bodies and who have a plan for creating equity with everything they do. Because I'm realizing that our chief executive officers, that's what they do. They, 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 they execute inequity, right? So I think we should call it what it is. So, yeah. Wow. Just reading a comment, sorry. Yeah, no, I was gonna wanna make sure you saw them because we're having a lot of comments that you got to read oh, them. I'm just seeing a couple of them, y'all. So please throw them my way. More questions. I don't want, this is a time for your all's voice. I'm sorry, I can't hear you more, but I'm not getting <laughs> part of what I was excited about and, and part of what I love about artist talks. You know, I hate talking about myself. I hate public speaking. I, I, I was so nervous all day, but I get so excited. Um, and and uh, it's hard to tell what hits or doesn't, y'all. I'm a lot uh, by design uh, because I have a far way to go, you know, and, and there's so much that, I haven't shared, um, but I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of your all's time. So please ask away. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, 
ask one more question that you started touching on and that is uh, runs through your work, but um, um, someone asked um, to speak more about using your body in your work and that do you consider your body to be the art or a vehicle for the art making? It, yes, and right? <laughs> so again, I think, and honestly, it started with I, divorcing myself from things like the master narrative, divorcing myself from my dear parents' expectations, you know, for their Mexican son, divorcing myself even for my own expectations on around authorship and the limits of my craft. So again, I found that when I make work with my whole body, um, you can tell, right? And so I, I think, it, it, so I've returned to a kind of, of constrained physicality. So uh, I, I do do a lot of physical training. I think part of my transition and healing was, you know, getting rid of, of, of habits that weren't helping me or bringing me joy. And so I, I got in, into like ultra marathoning. I swim, I, I you know, I, I, I do all the things with my body that, that I kind of hydrate it, right? I sleep. Um, um, but for me, I think it's because I'm creating this, this critical uh, uh, connection to the world so that when I'm in my studio, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't work with brushes. So the paintings that you see, you know, I'm, 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 I'm actually thinking of my body as a giant inkjet printer. Uh, I, I don't try to do a lot of thinking while I paint. I let myself feel. Sometimes I cry when I paint because um, I realize things that are so beautiful and powerful. Um, one of the paintings that I didn't share with y'all, but that's in the permanent collection of the Portland Art Museum is Sala Roja. And it's this really giant, long painting. Sala Roja is Spanish for uh, red living room. Mm. Uh, red is my mom's favorite color. And so everything in my house growing up was painting red or pink, right? So every variation of red. And, and, and anyway, so, you know, I, I grew up in watching this, this small epic theater, this Brechtian theater between my mom and dad playing out Mexican patriarchy. And, and I went to make a painting that judged my dad and kind of like, you know, kind of just saw my mom as, as, as the victim in it, which she, which she is and she was. Um, but, I, but I think the painting let me see how subjugated both of my parents were within the patriarchy. You, you know, and I, and I think that's something that, again, I didn't, it, I didn't expect and I didn't plan, but I think because I was open to it and I had, I had, I had practiced making other people open to listening to their work, I'm like, you got to listen to that, right? And, and so I, I think, again, it's this, this, this internalized world that I think my paintings try to get at. Uh, and I try to be as direct as possible with it. Um, and that means I make a body every day. You know, I, I think that's, and I, but I think for me, that's part of, of being connected to the land. Um, I'm not from Mexico, I'm from Amelia. Um, and, and, and actually, you know, we're from the earth and we're gonna to return to the earth. So when I connect with my body, I connect not just with the earth, but with my ancestors and the invisible college of people that loved and nurtured me into living and being. And again, I think outside of this, he this heteronormative settler capitalist, like anti-racist culture that we all live in, there's actually a surplus culture. Um, there's a lot of thoughts and feelings you can have way outside of capitalism, y'all. Um, and we're being so limited by white supremacy. We're being, we're being starved by white supremacy so that our bodies are weak. So we don't need to feel so full and joyful. That's what I, that's what I love the most about teaching art students and design students is that I learned that liberation isn't a geography that you find on a map. It's that thing you carry inside of you and you share with each other. It's awesome. And it's a mindset and it can go away. And one white guy can upset the whole uh, thing. One complicit, you know, uh, you know, person of color, global majority person, black person, indigenous person, that can upset it. When, you know, again, we, it's so easy to upset this profound liberation we all carry. I think that's really what I'm focused on in my studio is just making objects that carry that energy. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if people are going to think about my work, Stephanie, but I, I want them to sense that a human being made them mm -hmm. in a very complicated time. 
Yeah. I mean, I believe they do that. <laughs> I, believe, I believe, I see that they do that. I oh, see thank that you. they do that. Yeah. Uh, I hate to cut the conversation short, but we're, we are, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but I want to thank you so much on behalf of Scalehouse on just for myself. Um, this was incredibly energizing, um, educational, inspiring, motivating. Um, well, I want to thank my dear friends and art family that I see in, in the audience here. Thank you for attending today. What a pleasure. I yeah, love you all. I, my dad's listening. <laughs> ah, well, you know, uh, there, there. I have colleagues and, and, and students that I've worked with that, that, I, that I love dearly that I think, again, I think have, have contributed to uh, not, you know, uh, not just shaping my mind, but my whole being, which is uh, what I realized is my whole being goes way beyond my body. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think my students have, have taught me that the limits of my body uh, and language are not the limits of the world and that there's all these worlds beyond them that they carry that I'm so curious and suspicious about. So I hope they come visit me soon. Michelle. <laughs> and Aaron, please listen. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So happy to be in conversation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael, too. Yay. Bye, everybody.